Welcome to episode number 82 of the Beersmith Podcast. Today, homebrewing author John Palmer is joining us to share his five chips for new brewers. Today's podcast is sponsored by my book, Homebrewing with Beersmith, which is a collection of 70 of my best articles on homebrewing. The book is not specific to the Beersmith software, but instead provides great tips and advice on brewing in general. You can find Homebrewing with Beersmith at Amazon.com, both in printed and in Kindle editions. And also, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. I just got my second issue of this new magazine. It's 120 pages, packed with great advice on brewing saisons, Belgian beers, blending beers, new hop varieties, and much, much more. Order your subscription right now. It's really that good. An indispensable new magazine for brewers from beerandbrewing.com. And now, let's join this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is John Palmer, the author of How to Brew, as well as Brewing Classic Styles and his new book, Water. You can follow him at howtobrew.com. John, it's uh, fantastic to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Brad. It's good to be here. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing real well. Um, just busy as heck the last couple of months, uh, getting various things ready, getting ready for uh, this, this uh, summer's homebrewing conference out in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yeah, that's coming and, up in uh, just over a week, right? Yeah, and I've got a conference in Chicago the week before it, so leaving a day or so to head to that. Um, yeah, busy, busy month. And uh, today we're going to talk about your five priorities for home brewing uh, for new brewers, right? Right. right. One one question I get a lot from people is, uh, you know, well, this water thing, how important is it? And um, so I like to put it in perspective for people and talk about my five top priorities for brewing great beer. Fantastic. Well, before we get to that, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about our trip to uh, Brazil. Yeah, I was wondering if you could good share time. your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, Brazil is a wonderful country to visit. And um, the last time I was there, I went to uh, Piracicaba, which is uh, real close by Sao Paulo, which is their largest city. Mm -hmm. um, this time we went a little further south to the city of Florianopolis. And uh, this is down in the state of Santa Clarita, which is one of their southernmost states. And... Uh, yeah, and I was, was I was fortunate enough to go along with you. Yeah, it was myself and, there and Stan, see Stan Ryan Ryan was there with yeah. us, and uh, it's real fun. Pretty amazing, huh? It was. I mean, uh, I would, the beers down there are uh, pretty interesting. I mean, Brazil has uh, so much more fruit uh, to um, that they can put with their beer. Um, little different brewing traditions. Um, a lot of Italians and Germans settled in this, in those Southern states. And, uh, I was really impressed by the quality of some of the German styles that we were, of the beers that we were drinking. Um, yeah, there were several of them that, uh, were as good as anything I I've had before. Oh yeah. The craft brewing scene down there is really, is really coming along. It's, uh, they have, they've had the advantage of, um, you know, access to the internet for the last, you know, 10 years, all this home brewing knowledge out there. And so, um, you know, they've, they've learned how to brew very well, or they've known how to brew very well. It's just now that they're getting access to, um, some of the ingredients, some of the new hop varieties, yeast varieties, malt varieties that are out there. Um, there I've had, we had, you know, at that one Irish pub, we had some really good uh, IPAs. Absolutely. Um, I think one was from Shorenstein. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to the Shorenstein Brewery, too. Yep. Which was a very, very good uh, brew pub. Yeah, I found it interesting that they're, you know, they're still in their infancy there. They don't have a, a large home brewing community yet. It's, it's growing right. very rapidly. And the same thing with their microbreweries. Uh, you know, they're really just the whole craft brewing revolution that you know for us started in the late 80s early 90s is is just starting there too yeah but it's you know they're they're coming along very quick i think i mean that was one question we got from them was you know like where do you think we are and it's like oh if, you know a couple five years and you'll be you know you'll be right up there so i think they they are still in the process of educating the public um on the availability and variety of craft beer Mm -hmm. um, but it's coming along quick. 
Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the trip. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to get into your five tips for new homebrewers. So let's start with your first one. Okay. Well, um, obviously, somewhat obviously, the, the first priority for brewing great beer is sanitation. I mean, you can't brew good beer if it's, it gets spoiled by, you know, or fermented by uh, the wrong bugs. You know, you want your beer to be fermented by your yeast and not bacteria. So sanitation is critical in that regard. And uh, uh, what makes sanitation so hard? Well, um, for many people, I mean, um, you know, you're, you're, you're brewing in the home environment. Um, you may have kids, pets, um, house dust floating around. Um, all of these things, you know, can put bacteria in the air. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, cold and flu bacteria. I'm talking about beer spoilage bacteria, uh, bacteria that would like to get into the, our wort and eat those sugars. And, um, typically those, those bacteria will produce, um, acids, um, lactobacillus that's, you know, in, in your mouth, that's in milk and then various things. Um, pediococcus is another very common bacteria. Uh, that will also produce acid flavors in your work. And these are airborne and can easily settle on your equipment. So you've got you've to clean your equipment first and then sanitize it because you can't sanitize anything that's not clean. Now, now, what do you use for cleaning and sanitation? What do you recommend? Well, typically I use um, a PVW from Five Star. It's a really good cleaner. Um, just a little bit goes a long way. And uh, Star Sand from, from Five Star. Star Sand is nice in that it's a true no-rinse sanitizer mm -hmm. that you don't have to let dry. You can put it in a spray bottle and just spray it on your equipment and let it, you know, be wet for one to two minutes, and that surface will be sanitized. It actually works better than, say, you know, high-strength alcohol uh, in terms of sanitizing a surface. So, um, yeah, it's a very convenient sanitizer to use. So what's the uh, contact time for something like that? Yeah, just uh, two minutes will do it. Two minutes? Um, yeah. It doesn't take, take the long at all. Other sanitizers such as Iota 4 will also uh, sanitize in that time, two to five minutes. Um, but uh, Iota 4, to be uh, no rinse, um, you need to let that sanitizer completely evaporate from the surface. So that's a little drawback to uh, using Iota 4 is the need to let it evaporate or to rinse it with some pre-boiled water. Yeah, I used to use Iota 4 quite a bit, especially, especially with stainless steel kegs. Um, recently, yeah. I've been using Star Sand more, though. It's, conv it's very convenient, yeah. Yeah. Um, the only thing I want to mention with Star Sand, though, is the foaming, right? Yeah, the foaming, it, you know, it looks odd, and you, you worry about, well, what's all this sanitizer going to do to my beer but this the foam itself is flavorless it doesn't have any it doesn't affect the flavor of your beer at all um it breaks down very quickly once you expose it to the high organic matter in the wort mm -hmm. so um it's it's sanitizing ability at that point is very quickly overwhelmed um but meanwhile you know you can leave your bucket or your carboy you know open to the air that foam is going to sanitize and, you know, render harmless any airborne bacteria that happens to contact the foam. So it's, you know, it's a good residual sanitizer in that regard. So don't be afraid of the foam, huh? Not at all. <laughs> and I've fermented batches on a carboy full of foam just to prove it to myself and the beer is fine. So. Uh, well, let's go into your, uh, your next tip then. Well, next is fermentation temperature. Uh, you need a consistent, controlled fermentation environment. Um, and then really this is after, you know, not spoiling the beer with uh, contamination, may, being able to maintain a consistent fermentation temperature is your best tool for creating a good beer. Um, you want to have that fermentation temperature you know, uh, in the middle of its preferred temperature range, 
for ales, that's, you know, anywhere from 65 to 70 F or I think that's uh, 18 to 22 C. Yeah, that's about 20 right. C. Um, for loggers, uh, 55 to 60 F, um, which is 12 to 14 C, if I remember right. Right. Or 12 to 12 to 16, somewhere there. Mm-hmm. Sorry. But anyway, um, you know, that way your yeast is working at the optimum conditions. It's producing the right balance of uh, esters. Um, it's not producing lots of off flavors such as uh, diacetyl and acetaldehyde, um, things that can be, you know, can be, the yeast will produce more of them at high temperatures. And, uh, and then that can be left over in the beer. Very common problem for a lot of home brewers is they'll um, chill their wort, and, but they only get it down to, say, 80 or 85 degrees, right. you know, before they pitch their yeast. And then, you know, the yeast start working, the beer, the, you know, the, the fermentation is very warm, and then it gradually cools over a couple of days, um, you know, as they, because they've moved it to, you know, a cooler room in the house. Well, all those yeast byproducts I have been producing that first, you know, 36 hours and those uh, uh, mainly esters, works, right? Yeah. Well, esters and also the other, all the other things, um, could be fusel alcohols, um, acetaldehyde, um, the dia, the diacetyl pre- precursors, um, you know, all these different things. The yeast will clean them up, but if the temperature has actually gone down over the course of fermentation, they're not as active and they won't clean up. And so there'll be a lot more let of these off flavors left behind. So again, consistent fermentation, temperature control, very important. Yeah. It's something we were discussing down in Brazil. A lot of people don't know that when you ferment, it does, you know, the yeast itself generates heat and raises the temperature. Yes. yes. Yeah. In a free rise uh, situation is kind of traditional where, you know, you, you cool your um, wort cold, cooler than the fermentation temperature. Pitch, you know, I'm talking just a few degrees. Pitch a little bit cooler. Let that get, let that yeast get going, and the fermentation temperature in the wort will start rising. And that kind of situation where there's a gradual free rise in the uh, temperature of the fermentation will help the yeast actually clean up all those uh, byproducts. And you can, you'll get a cleaner beer that way. So um, to uh, kind of summarize, you either want to maintain a very, very consistent temperature, or ma- maintain an environment where the temperature starts out cooler and can free rise to a slightly warmer temperature. But again, you don't want to exceed the recommended temperature range for the yeast. So John, uh, what do you recommend for controlling your fermentation temperature? Um, there's a lot of kind of do it yourself, uh, methods, um, setting the fermenter into a large bucket of water or a water bath. Um, the extra thermal mass of the water will help, you know, moderate the temperature. Um, I've, you know, I've fermented in, you know, a spare, spare bathtub in the house, you know, if you have, if you have one or I bought a big, um, beer tub and set the fermenter inside that. Um, having a temperature controlled fridge is probably the best way, yeah. uh, such as we have here. Yep. A uh, temperature controller on a fridge is, is very nice. That way you can, you know, you can dial in a specific temperature for your yeast and, uh, and even play with the fermentation temperature for a particular style, for a particular recipe and improve, you know, and find the temperature that works best for your recipe. Now, John, talk about why you need a separate temperature controller for, say, a conventional fridge. That's a good point. Um, the, you know, refrigerator is designed to keep things, you know, fairly cold. And, you know, anywhere from 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, zero to five degrees C. That's a typical uh, range where these refrigerators are designed to work. Um trying to adjust the thermostat inside the fridge to maintain a higher temperature um, puts a lot of strain on the compressor. It, you know, it keeps starting and shutting off and starting and and shutting off. 
it's better to have um, a more controllable and um, higher resolution controller on the refrigerator that can maintain a, a narrower temperature profile. Yeah, and a lot of them, a lot of them you can't set high enough to get into say right. you know low L temperature yeah. ranges. And the thermostat on a fridge is not designed to hold a very narrow temperature band either. It, the temperature in, you know, just the fridge itself may swing plus or minus five degrees, you know, um, before it kicks in and cools the wort uh, or down, you know, down to the, the target temperature. So, again, a, an external controller can maintain a much narrower range. So let's talk about some alternatives to a fridge. You mentioned uh, an ice bath is one. Or yeah, a bath ice of some bath kind. or a water bath, uh, depending on this, you know, the temperature range you're looking at. Um, a water bath that you can put in a couple of bottles of ice, you know, and change those out to maintain a, a temperature range works well. Um, if you're doing an ale, uh, if you're doing it in a fairly dry climate, you can use evaporation by setting the fermenter in a shallower pan with water in it and putting a towel or a t-shirt over the carboy or fermentation bucket, the uh, wicking of moisture and evaporation of the water through that cloth will help cool that and help you uh, keep the temperature down in your fermentation. Yeah, I've used that Those before, some- just wrap, you know, wrap the carboy in, uh, in a couple of wet towels and keep wetting them every 12 hours or so. It seems to take it down at yeah. least a few degrees. Yeah, those work well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the best way is a temperature-controlled fridge. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, John, let's talk about your third tip now. Okay. So, you, we kind of move from uh, fermentation environment. Uh, we're going to, you know, which is a kind of an external control. Now, we're going to look kind of the internal control of our fermentation, our yeast management. Um, and there's a couple aspects to yeast management, one of which is pitching rate. You got to make sure that you're pitching enough yeast to the beer to ferment it. Um, I've got an example where I talk about, you know, sheep in a field. If you've got um, one acre of land that you put one sheep on, you know, in other words, the sheep is supposed to, you know, eat that grass and reproduce and create wool for the farmer and so on you know, one sheep on one acre is not going to be very effective. Um, if you put a hundred sheep on that one acre, they're going to eat all that grass, but there's not really enough food there to um, support reproduction, to support much wool growth. What you need is the right number of sheep for the right number of grass, you know, amount of grass to get, you know, to get the best of all worlds where, you know, reproduction occurs, you get more wool, you get all the grass eaten is exactly the same situation for fermenting your beer. You want to have enough yeast to ferment all the sugars. You want to have uh, the right amount so that is that a, a uh, optimum amount of yeast growth occurs because it's during the yeast growth process that the yeast generate these esters and other uh, flavors, you know, the byproducts that give the give our beer its flavor, uh, its signature characteristic flavors um, that you want to produce. Absolutely, absolutely. So, how do you uh, make sure that you're pitching enough yeast? Well, there's um, yeast pitching rate calculators available online. Uh, there's a section in my book um, on in how to brew that talks about it. Um, there's the yeast book by Chris White and Jamil Zanishev that gives some f- further insight into it. And there's, there's a lot of resources available to help you understand how much yeast to pitch to certain gravity, you know, uh, beers. Um, and, you know, it helps to make a starter for your yeast cultures to, you know, ensure that you're pitching enough yeast. Now, when, um, uh, when do you actually need a starter? Well, you need a starter uh, anytime your um, initial cell count is not up to the task of fermenting uh, the amount of work that you have, both gravity and volume. Um, a, a single tube of, say, White Labs or a single smack pack of Y yeast uh, each contain about 100 billion cells. And 
you know, in a, in a perfect world, that is enough to ferment about a 10 Plato or um, 1040 original gravity, five gallons of 1040. Uh, but that's only if the smack pack's brand new, right? Right. I mean, you know, there's some age considerations on your yeast that you have to be aware of. So it's often a good uh, practice to pitch that yeast, uh, that yeast tube or smack pack to a starter, which is a small volume of wort, like a, a liter or two liters, and let that ferment that wort first. It does two things. It revitalizes the yeast. You know, it's like giving them a snack after, you know, or breakfast or something before they get going on the main batch. And two, it gives them time to build up their numbers. So you may start out with 100 billion cells, but after pitching the yeast to that starter, now you've got 200 billion cells. And that's enough to ferment a stronger beer, say like 1050 or 1060. Uh, so that's, that's why you would use a yeast starter. Excellent. Um, what about dry yeast? Well, dry yeast usually has a lot more um, uh, cells uh, per batch or, you know, the little sachets often have, um, I think it's around 200 billion cells are in that, you know, 11 gram sachet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they can, uh, you know, ferment a higher gravity, more wort right off the bat. Um, also when they make dry yeast, in addition to putting, you know, extra cells in the package, just as insurance, they also, uh, package them at a point where they've been through the starter process, the buildup process. They have, uh, good levels of glycogen reserves, which is like a food source for the yeast. Um, and the only thing you need to be aware of when using a dry yeast is that the uh, yeast packet needs to be rehydrated first. Now, a lot of people say you can just sprinkle the dry yeast directly on top of the wort and it'll work. And that's true. But you got to understand that doing so is, you know, incurring a little bit of osmotic shock to the yeast. They have to try to rehydrate their body um, in a higher gravity sugar solution. Um, and they're going to get, you know, it's going to be harder for them to pull water across the cell membrane because the sugar solution is, is attracting that same water. So it's better to rehydrate dry yeast in plain water mm -hmm. in lukewarm plain water first, and then, uh, pitch them to your batch. Absolutely. Uh, well, let's go on to your fourth tip. Fourth. Well, okay. So now we've, we've talked about sanitation, not spoiling the batch. We've talked about external fermentation conditions, internal fermentation conditions. Now we can talk about recipe proportions. Um, it's very easy to, uh, you know, have a bad recipe. Um, you are, you know. I can vouch for that. Yeah. Good fermentation, bad recipe, not a great beer. Um, you, on the other hand, you know, you can have a, a good fermentation of a bad recipe and still have a fairly drinkable beer. But if you have a bad fermentation of a great recipe, you really don't have much beer at all. So, um, that's why I say fermentation is a higher priority than the recipe proportions. Um, a lot of home brewers, when they start out, they go through the same progression where, um, they'll start out with a simple kit mm -hmm. and then they'll say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to make this beer strong and I'm going to add more of this particular malt or I'm going to make it really roasty or I'm going to make it very hoppy. Um, and yeah, it's a, an interesting beer, but it's not a really good beer. So I did that. Uh, I call, I call it everything, but the kitchen sink brewing. Exactly. Yeah. You put in every, you, if, if some grains are good, especially grains are good, then a lot of green, good grains must be better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I want more of that coffee flavor. I want more of this caramel flavor in my, in my beer. And it's easy to go overboard with recipe portions. So generally, um, if you're looking at, uh, either an extract kit or an all grain recipe, your signature characteristics of a style, um, you're looking at somewhere around a half pound or, uh, 
um, 250 grams of a specialty malt for that signature flavor per five gallon, 20 liter batch. Um, for accent flavors of, from specialty malts, you're looking at quarter pound amounts or 125 gram amounts for that five gallon, 20 liter batch size. Um, those kind of rule of thumb proportions will help you uh, over, keep from overwhelming the flavor profile of the beer. So keep it, keep it small, right? Yeah. Keep it simple. Keep it small. And another thing a lot of beginning brewers tend to do is uh, lots of variety. I'm going to add, you know, six different specialty malts to this beer um, or this malt. This, this beer is made from 10 different malts. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm going to have lots of complexity. And what a lot of people don't realize is that it can, if you, if you can't taste every ingredient that you've put in, then there's no real point in putting them in. Uh, if you look at uh, commercial beer recipes, um, you know, of, of classic styles, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, Yungling Porter, um, um, Anchor Steam, um, Guinness Stout. I mean, classic beers typically only have two, three, four malts maximum. Um, and some, you know, home, some home brewers might say, well, that's because that's all they can afford to do. But I tell you, you know, every craft brewer worth his salt is not going to, uh, skimp on his recipe, making his beer. If he feels that his recipe needs that additional specialty malt, um, they don't put them in because you generally can't taste it. And it, you know, the clarity of flavors can do more to create a great beer than going overboard on complexity, trying to achieve complexity. So John, do you have any thoughts on how people can better understand their ingredients? I know a lot of people think, you know, chocolate malt tastes like chocolate and caramel malt tastes like caramel, but that's not really the case in most cases. Yeah. Well, you know, it helps to go to a homebrew shop and try the malts, you know, just get uh, 10 kernels or, you know, teaspoon worth of, of the malt and eat it, you know, put it in your mouth, chew it up and eat it. Um, you'll get a sense of those flavors. Um, and you can also get a sense of pro the proportions of flavors, you know, make up a mini grain bill, put in, you know, um, 10, 10 kernels of, of their base malt, two kernels of the specialty malt, two kernels of this other specialty malt, make a little mini mash, you know, in your hand and chew that up and you'll get that interplay of flavors to some extent. Um, better yet is to make a small, uh, tea out of the malts. Um, you know, crush them up, put them in some hot water, let it sit a few minutes and then drink that, drink that tea that you make that work. Of course you can add some hops too, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, get a, get a real sense of those flavors. Um, I, I like to compare creating beer recipes to creating sandwiches. Um, we're all familiar with how to make sandwiches. You know, you don't put on, you know, half a jar of mustard on a sandwich, you know, with only one piece of ham and one piece of cheese. Uh, you know, you don't put on uh, an inch thick layer of peanut butter um, and horseradish to make a, to make an interesting sandwich. You know, look at beer styles the way you do sandwich styles. Look at beer styles as a guide to what kinds of flavors work well together. Um, look at, Re, um, recipe books such as uh, brewing classic styles or clone brews. Um, there's lots of recipe resources out there. And by looking at other people's recipes for styles, you can get a better sense of proportions, what, you know, the kinds of specialty malts will work in a recipe um, and, and get a, get a head start on designing your own recipes. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of times I'll go online to Beersmith recipes or one of the other recipe sites and yes, pull up exactly. a bunch of recipes in the style that I want and, and then look through what are they using for grains? What are they using right. for proportions? How do they right. mix together? You know? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah. The, your recipe site is a great resource in that regard. Um, well, let's go on to your fifth point, John. Well, now we come to water. 
Um, and this, you know, again, looking back, we've got, you know, uh, contamination or preventing contamination. We've got fermentation management and we've got recipe. Now we come to water. Water is that kind of final 10% on most beer styles. You can make good beer without worrying about water. If you can understand how water affects your beer, um, then you can turn a good beer into a great beer. If you don't understand how water affects your beer and you try adjusting it, you can turn a good beer into a lousy beer. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. But in general, water affects beer flavor in three ways. One is your sulfate to chloride ratio. Sulfate accentuates hop, the hop character, kind of dries out the beer character. Chloride accentuates the malt character, accentuates the roundness and fullness and sweetness of the malt character. So if you look at the ratio of sulfate ion to chloride ion, not chlorine, chloride in the water, that is in a very real sense, your seasoning of the beer, it's your salt and pepper in your food. It gives a kind of a balance of dry hoppiness to round, full sweetness in your beer. Now, it's not magic, but it is, you know, it is a lever that you can use. The second way that the water affects your beer is by the total seasoning level, how much mineral or how much salt is in that water um, that, you know, influences those beer flavors. You can have very light. Um, uh, waters and beer styles such as Bohemian Pilsner. Bohemian Pilsner is a very, uh, is an assertive, you know, uh, mid-level strength beer, uh, fairly high bitterness, but it's a very soft beer, a very soft bitterness. And that's due to the very low mineral levels that the water has that they brew with. Then you look at German Pilsner. German Pilsner has more of a medium level of minerals. And now you have a Pilsner style beer that has some sharper edges to it has some has some some oomph for you know some some assertive a little more assertive bitterness and a little brighter malt character because it has more seasoning. Uh, third example is Dortmunder Export, a very robust Pilsner style beer, very similar malt bill and hop bill to the other styles, but the the heavy mineral level in that water. Uh, adds to a much more assertive beer character, much firmer malt body, much drier, and more assertive hop character. So kind of total mineral levels is your second uh, uh, way that water can influence beer. The third way is pH. Now, uh, this is where water starts getting complicated. And I encourage you, rather than trying to understand what I'm saying here, Read in How to Brew, read the water book, and I'll do a better job of explaining it in the book. Um, but basically, uh, the pH of the beer influences how the beer's flavors are expressed in your palate. The, if the beer is alkaline, you know, from having a too alkaline water source, then the pH rises. It goes from a nominal beer range of like 3.8 to 4.5 it'll go higher than that up towards five and that causes the malt character to be kind of dull a little lifeless it can also cause the hop character to be heavy and uh, more coarse in its bitterness if the ph of the beer goes too low you know down towards the low end like three and a half three point eight you know and that kind of in that area, um, this can cause the malt character to become kind of one-dimensional. Um, a lot, it's very common to taste, you get to go to a brew pub that makes great pale ale and then try their porter or their stout and think, oh, this is good, but you don't taste much more than, say, a roast character or a coffee or chocolate chocolate character. You know, that there's not a lot of complexity to the malt character in a beer like that. And the hop character is not very well defined. Um, low beer pH tends to attenuate the hop character and it tends to attenuate or 
uh, narrow the malt complexity. When you get to a, a pH, the ideal pH for that recipe, um, somewhere in, you know, in the middle of the 3.8 to 4.5 range, although that depends on the stuff, on the particular style and the particular recipe that you're brewing. Well, when you get the pH right, now you get a balance of, you know, uh, malt liveliness and uh, hop uh, bitterness. You can taste the balance of the two very well. And you're tasting all of the flavors that that beer has to offer. There's no loss in life or complexity of the beer. So, uh, John, what do you do if you don't have a good handle on what your local water source actually looks like? Ah, well, um, the first way is, of course, to call your local water supplier, whether it's the city or the county or whatever have you. Um, go online, look for your water quality reports. Um, these are often readily available. You know, just look up your city's water quality report for this year. Um, those water quality reports uh, are are an annual average. So depending on, you know, the source of your city's water, you know, in some cases, uh, a city may pull from surface water during the summer and ground water during the winter. Um, or vice versa, as the case may be. And that changing water profile can um, cause issues if you're looking at just an annual average. You know, in, the, in other words, in the summer, your, your alkalinity and hardness could be very low. And in the winter, they could be very high. Um, but you're only looking at the, the average, you know, when it's time to brew. And so you're kind of, you're kind of missing both seasons. Um, when it comes to trying to understand how your water is going to impact your beer flavor. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of. Uh, the other thing you can do is buy a water test kit. Um, and these test kits are readily, readily available. Um, a lot of brew shops okay, carry them. I think them. you got one in the background there, right? Why don't you pull it up on the video real quick? Oh yeah. Yeah. There. This is the, uh, the brew lab from Lamont. Uh -huh. um, I helped develop this kit and it can, it's designed to test all of the um, parameters that you need to test for uh, testing your water. Yeah, hold it up just a little more. Yeah. Kind of uh, tip them up, right? They all kind of fell over. Looks like the cat's been in here again. Um, the cat likes uh, your water test kit. Oh yeah. You know, cats, they, they love to, uh, to disturb brewing, but um, what it you know it contains uh, bottles that and uh, test tubes that you can use to test your water, and these are simple dropper tests where you put a water sample in the tube, drop you know put in a few drops of a reagent, and you look for color change, and that will tell you um, the amount of minerals in your water. Within, you know, 10 ppm or, you know, a ballpark like that. And that's adequate. You really don't need, you know, high resolution numbers on this to understand what the effect of your brewing water on your beer is going to be. And this is a very good way to, uh, to find that out. Very cool. So uh, I think a lot of the major online stores carry this, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of uh, stores have started carrying it and it's available directly from Lamont's website as well. Yeah, I've got it here, lamotte.com, L-A-M-O-T-T-E.com. Yep. So they that's offer the, the Brew Lab Basic, and then they also offer the Brew Lab Plus, which includes a high-quality pH meter to, as well. Excellent. Uh, well, John, what about, uh, what about people that don't have uh, uh, good water for brewing? Let's say your tap water. You know, I, I work from a well, for example, and my well water is not all that great. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, bottled water from the grocery store uh, is another alternative, um, although that can be kind of expensive for some people. Uh, down in Brazil, a friend of ours uh, brews with rainwater. Uh, rainwater is a good is a good source of water. It's very low mineral, of course, um, but and that allows you to add brewing salts to the water to build up to a, a profile suitable for the beer style that you're brewing. Um, the water book that we put out just this past year uh, has tables of suggested mineral profiles 
that you can use to understand uh, how much of a particular brewing salt you add to create a, a type of water for a type of style. And your Beersmith software also has um, lists of uh, water profiles and uh, as well as real nice calculator for adding brewing salts to a water to build a particular profile. Um, what about extract brewers? I think this is important, important topic that you mentioned. Right. And, uh, extract brewing, you know, the brewmaster that made the wort that is concentrated in the malt extract has already done his water adjustments. He's added brewing salts to his water to make a good mash, to make a good flavor profile. And all those minerals in the water get concentrated along with the sugars. So when you're brewing with malt extract, very often what you need to do is only use distilled water to rehydrate those concentrated minerals and sugars. Um, if you have soft water at home or, you know, a low alkalinity water source, such as a surface water source, um, like the Great Lakes or, you know, a river or rainwater, then you can Aquifer. use that water. Yeah. If you have a groundwater source, though, that is high in minerals, um, that may be too much mineral character for the beer that you're brewing. You know, if the malt, you know, because the malt extract already has, a, you know, some level of minerals in it. Well, John, I wanted to wrap up uh, uh, this discussion. I wonder if you had any final thoughts on your five tips. Um, yeah, just, you know, um, brewing, brewing may seem complicated, but, uh, you know, the old keep it simple uh, added, uh, um, was a, not addendum, uh, ad additive? No. <laughs> anyway, whatever that word is, <laughs> rule. You know, the Tip. old rule, keep it simple, uh, applies. So, you know, uh, don't stress too much on water. Uh, it's number five. You can brew really good beer without worrying about water, uh, without worrying about water adjustment. You know, hit those four, the, the four top uh, priorities first. And um, I think, uh, you know, when, when our, our brewing DVDs come out uh, later this year, uh, we'll be able to show uh, in practice, what we're talking about here now, uh, show how we adjust water, show how we, you know, brew throughout the day. Well, I wanted to talk about that topic next. Um, you were down here about a month ago and, yeah. uh, down here in Virginia and we did uh, a lot of filming. Yeah, it was real, it was real fun. Uh, I think we made a real high quality DVD, uh, two of them. In fact, one on extract brewing and one on all grain. Um, and, uh, You'll be able to see those later this year um, where we kind of demonstrate the brewing process. So if, uh, if you have a hard time, you know, visualizing the brewing process from just reading, reading a book, um, now you'll be able to see it uh, and see us doing it, um, kind of putting, our, you know, uh, putting what we talk about into practice. Yeah, we got uh, two DVDs we're working on. One of them is uh, how to brew extract, and the other one is uh, how to brew all grain. And the extract one will be out uh, probably in uh, early to mid July. And I have a trailer out for that already. In fact, I may uh, I may throw it in here for those of you watching the video. I'll try and throw it in at the end here. Uh, I'll just paste it in here. But um, uh, those are going to be some great DVDs, and the the second one's coming out uh, in September. But um, really uh, professional, uh, professionally done, you know, high quality DVDs on brewing. Yeah. And it's John and I brewing uh, all grain and extract with stuff that you'd find off the shelf. We don't have a $20,000 brewing system or anything like that. That's right. So, it's home brewing at its finest. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to that. That's been, uh, been a lot of fun. Quite a, quite a project uh, taken on yeah, there. Yeah, it really was. So I, I just want to mention you can learn more about that at uh, beersmith.com slash DVD. Again, that's uh, beersmith.com slash DVD. And we'll have announcements and uh, some more trailers coming out shortly on, on both of those videos. Okay. So looking forward to that. Well, John, uh, any closing thoughts from you? Uh, no, just, um, you know, keep, keep on brewing. Uh, you know, pay attention to your, to the basics. 
sanitation, good fermentation environment, good fermentation control. And, uh, you know, you take the time to read about water and understand it, but don't stress about it. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. And again, today, my guest on the show was Mr. John Palmer. He's the author of How to Brew, as well as Brewing Classic Styles, and his new book, Water, a practical guide. You can follow his writing at howtobrew.com. Thanks, John. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. You can learn more about the DVDs that John and I are publishing at beersmith.com slash DVD. Again, that's beersmith.com slash DVD. Also, a big thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Issue number two is packed with great articles on brewing, and I urge you to start your subscription today at beerandbrewing.com. Once again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And finally, a reminder, if you enjoy my newsletters, you can get 70 of my best articles in book form. Just look for the title, Home Brewing with Beersmith, on Amazon.com or your Kindle device. Thank you again for listening, and have a great brewing week. Some people learn to brew by reading a book, but others prefer to see beer actually being brewed. 